Du musst nur nicht mehr Wörter ansprechen. <lacht> so, welcome back after the break. It's my pleasure to announce Stephanie Barth, who is a professor of quantum physics at the University of Stuttgart since two years. She got a PhD with a very famous quantum physicist in Vienna, Anton Zeidinger, where she got a PhD. Then she went to Oxford as a postdoc and worked there, and then came immediately back to Stuttgart. I always say she is the youngest professor of quantum physics, but she said, no, that's not true. There are a few that are younger because our rector was too lazy to negotiate with her. Otherwise, she would have been the youngest. So, <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to her talk, Quantum Networks and Quantum Clouds, a physics perspective. Definitely, right. Thank you very much for that introduction. So, I have this microphone here. I hope you can hear me. Oh, it's on the back. Okay, thank you very much. So, as Frank said, I'm a physicist. And I will repeat a bit of the stuff that Frank just told us from a kind of physicist perspective. So you will get a kind of slightly different view of quantum computing. Then I will go to quantum cryptography and then um, to quantum networks and quantum clouds. I try to be less mathematical and show lots of pictures. If you have any questions, feel just free to ask me and interrupt me. Also, I'm happy to discuss later. So when we talk about quantum technologies, many people think of quantum computing but there are actually many different quantum technologies. And the basic principle is that they um, harness quantum physics to gain some functionality that is not available using classical techniques. So one prime example, as we just heard, is quantum computing. There's quantum communication, quantum photography. There are quantum simulations where we try to um, simulate properties of materials using quantum physical effects. There's quantum metrology and quantum sensing where we try to, to do precise measurements and to sense, um, sense something that is very you know, tiny properties and there are quantum memories which is some kind of quantum storage. So today as I said I will focus on quantum computing and quantum communication and in the second part of the talk I will kind of merge the two and talk a bit about something that is called a quantum network. So the outline of my talk I We'll start with quantum computing from a physicist's perspective. Then I will talk a bit about quantum hardware. So we had a few questions about quantum hardware. We heard a bit about IBM, but there are a few other technologies. We'll talk about quantum key distribution, so quantum communication, and then talk about quantum networks, which kind of merges the best of both worlds. <coughs> so what is quantum computing? Um, as a physicist, um, when we talk about quantum physics, Quantum physics, this is not only mathematics, but we go back to the foundations of quantum physics when people in the kind of 1920s try to understand what already existed. So this is what we now call the kind of first quantum revolution. So these kind of people came up with quantum theory, which is the foundation of modern quantum technology. And what is pretty amazing about this time is that people weren't able to do experiments, they didn't have lasers, they didn't have qubits, they didn't have atoms, they didn't have single quantum systems to manipulate. So they just did thought experiments <coughs> and it was kind of Bohr and Einstein discussing quantum physics. And I find this pretty amazing because nowadays we can do the experiments they thought about um, at that time. And at the same time these people couldn't think of being able to manipulate basic of quantum systems when they were discussing the foundations. So as we already heard in quantum physics, we talk about qubits and we try these kind of spheres. Um, and instead of having just a single qubit, a single bit, which is zero or one, we have these superposition states that can be depicted as um, these spheres. And we have these complex amplitudes here, um, which correspond to probabilities. So sum of two, um, the absolute value squared sum of two one. And in my talk when I show something like this, I always need a qubit. Then we heard already we have this strange effect called quantum entanglement, and this means that two qubits are kind of connected um, in such a way that if we perform a measurement of one qubit here, this changes the state of the other qubit. There are some famous states called Bell states that Frank already showed, and we'll see a bit more about them when we talk about quantum communication. So, um, quantum
quantum entanglement, you can imagine like we have a system that is separated, can be separated over two distant locations, <coughs> for example, the Earth and the Moon. And no matter how far they are apart, a measurement of one key will change the state of another. Um, there could be a issue on the Moon, which has not been demonstrated, but what has been demonstrated is some entanglement and distribution between empty satellites and Earth. So going to space is kind of one challenge in quantum technology. So as we also heard, as we cannot have only have two qubits entangled, but we can have complex multi-parted entangled states. And this means if I touch one of the qubits here, this will affect the other qubits in the state. And this can go even bigger, bigger, bigger. So I can have complex systems and they are all kind of entangled. And if I do something to one qubit, this will affect here the rest of the system. And this kind of multi-parted entanglement or entanglement is what makes quantum computing so powerful. So what we also heard in Frank's talk is that in quantum computing we can have quantum circuits. So I often talk quantum, in, about quantum circuits just in terms of quantum gates and these kind of pictures here. And this basically means we have some qubits here as an input then we have some quantum gates. They can act on single qubits, they can act on two qubits, they can act on multiple qubits. We do some quantum processing here, and in the end, we perform a measurement, and this measurement gives us the output of the computation. So there are a few quantum algorithms that have been um, shown to be faster than classical algorithms, and they have been demonstrated also in experiments. So we already heard about Krober's algorithm, which is about searching in databases. Um, I think Frank quickly mentioned Deutsch's algorithm. There is Shaw's algorithm for factoring um, numbers into the prime factors. There is a quantum algorithm for solving systems of linear equations. And there are also um, machine learning applications. And this is why quantum computing is so interesting, because if we have a speed up compared to classical computers, um, we can solve problems faster, and we can solve problems that we might not be able to solve in classical computers. However, when you, talk, when you hear people talking about quantum computing, there are often these kind of many statements about quantum computers. And some of these statements are quantum computers are better than classical computers because they are faster. Or you might hear quantum computers can solve all our problems, so it's kind of super machines. Um, I would like to show you that this is not entirely correct or even wrong with an example. An example I'd like to pick is the linear equations algorithm, or also called HHL algorithm, named after the authors of the paper. So when we have a system of linear equations, we have something like A times X is equal to B. And because we're quantum physicists, we have the quantum state X and we have the quantum state B. And this A is still our matrix. So if we want to solve a system of linear equations, we are looking for the state X. So we're actually looking for some kind of quantum circuit where we input A, we input B, and we get out this X here. So it has been shown that um, using quantum physics, there is some kind of algorithm, the agent L algorithm, which shows a speed up um, in N. So it's kind of log N versus N classically, and N is the kind of the size of the matrix. However, now if you look at the details of this algorithm, you see there are a few kind of tiny points that you have to consider. And these points are, okay, I need my input state as a quantum state, or my input vector as a quantum state. Um, that's one thing I have to do, so I have to have my data in some kind of quantum form available. Then I have to apply some operations which depend on a matrix A, and this can only be done efficiently if the matrix is sparse, so we have some kind of conditions on the matrix. Then we have some more conditions on the matrix, namely, um, some conditions on the eigenvalues of the matrix. And the most interesting point is, okay, this scales efficiently if we 
don't write down x. So x is a vector which contains n elements. If I write down n elements, I use augment my speed up. So this algorithm scales um, with this kind of speed up if I don't have to write down x. And this could be useful still if I just want to measure a property of x. So if I have my vector x and I can apply one operator or one measurement of x which tells me is x smaller or larger than this or this, then I have to speed up. But if I want to write down my x, um, I might lose a bit in, in efficiency. So then if you look at the details, you see the speed up we have in quantum not only depends on n, but it also depends on the matrix of the sparsity and the condition number and so on. And the main take home message um, I want to give you is, um, yes, quantum computers are better than classic computers, but only in certain problems and under certain conditions. And if you pick the right problems and the right conditions, um, then you have a huge benefit. But just saying quantum computers are better than classic computers um, might not be completely um, correct. Um, so, so we saw now, okay, quantum computing is amazing because we have all these quantum algorithms that we can use, but hmm, how do we build one? So we can go, um, can take a piece of paper and a pencil and invent the best quantum algorithms ever, but we need a quantum computer. And there was some person called David DiVincenzo who, I think almost 20 years ago, um, wrote down some criteria, some kind of wish list we want for a physical quantum system we need. So all these criteria need to be fulfilled when we want to um, have a physical quantum computer. And the first criterion he wrote down is, okay, we need a scalable physical quantum system with well-characterized qubits. So we need a physical system, for example, um, an atom or an ion or a superconducting qubit, which we can, can scale up. We can have many of them. And the qubits are well characterized, so zero is always zero and one is always one. The next thing he wrote down is the ability to initialize, initialize the state of the qubit. So this might seem obvious, but you could imagine I have some physical system, imagine just a single atom, but I can't get it to the ground state. So um, I need to be able to repair the initial state of the qubit. Then, very important, we heard about this briefly already, um, we need stable qubits for long coherence times. Um, when we have a quantum system, like a superconducting qubit, this interacts with the environment all the time, or an atom try to isolate a single atom from the kind of uh, whole environment. So you have interactions, and this means that your quantum state just decays or decoheres, and then you can't use the qubit anymore. So we need long decoherence times. We need to be able to apply quantum gains. So if we have this qubit, we want to try some transitions, and we want to operate this qubit, and also we need to be able to read all the qubit. And these are five criteria that he wrote down, and they seem pretty obvious now. However, if you go back to Schrodinger or something that is attributed to Schrodinger, it seems um, it might be more difficult because what Schrodinger said it it is no more possible to experiment with single particles <coughs> than it is to raise big theosaurs in the zoo. And I'm not sure how many of you have seen living big theosaurs in the zoo but raising them is pretty challenging, and that is what people try to do in quantum physics. So there are a few candidate systems um, for quantum computers, and these few candidate systems are, for example, ion traps, so we use single charged particles as a qubit. We use single atoms that are put into such a lattice, we have heard of the superconducting qubits already. We can use spins in silica. We can use photons or spins in diamonds. And there are many other candidates for this. So I'd like to introduce a few of them in a bit more detail and you see what the kind of challenges are and why you can't just have a 
100 qubit quantum computer. So when having such an ion trap, you have some <coughs> single ions here, and you trap them with kind of electric fields that have kind of oscillating and static fields. And with this, if you do everything right, you manage to kind of trap a string of ions here. And then you manipulate the ions by shining laser light onto them. So you might remember from, from physics at school, um, you have some kind of energy level system, and if you shine light in, you're kind of, um, you go up one level in energy. And uh, what you can also show is that by driving the right transitions at the right wavelength, you can also go down, and you can also go into superposition state. So what this kind of means is you have to trap all these single ions in this kind of chain, and you have to apply very precise laser light at the right frequency, at the right pulse duration, and at a very right position to them. And this then implements single qubit gate. And if you want to implement two qubit gates, you have to apply light or pulses to two of these ions. And now you see already why we can't have 50, because having all these single ions in this trap is extremely challenging. To isolate them from the environment is extremely challenging. And also to um, apply this laser light to exactly the right position at the right time is very <coughs> challenging. Um, this is how these labs look like. So um, this is your ion trap quantum computer. What you see is there's lasers, and there's all kinds of optical elements, and these optical elements are there to prepare the light you shine onto these ions. And this is just kind of a sh small part of the optical table, I think. It's just prepare this laser light, and you can imagine three times as many of those components to control it as ion trap quantum computer. Um, what people are working on also at ion traps is on integration. So instead of having these kind of wildly physical traps, try to kind of put ions onto these chips. Um, but you see, you still have to put laser light onto there, and you have to read out and control the ions, and it's um, very, very challenging. So this is a recent experiment from last year where they managed to trap 20 ions in such a trap. And you see, you can see them here in this kind of beautiful chain. And then in this paper, they did some operations on this kind of ion trap. And now you can imagine if you want to have an entangling gate between this ion here and this ion here, it's kind of very challenging. So what people do is they try to have neighboring qubits talking to each other. So this is what ion traps. We heard briefly about superconducting qubits already. And superconducting qubits basically um, work in a very similar way, but they are kind of artificially created atoms. And this means that we, um, out of some electrical circuits, with some capacitors, some conductors, and some part called Cholofen junction, we create some artificial atom, which you can control by shining microwaves at desired frequencies. And so when we look at this whole thing here, and instead of shining laser light, we shine kind of microwave frequencies and we kind of can tune the state of the superconducting qubit. And this is an example for a superconducting qubit chip. Um, what you see is you have um, six qubits here, and then you have these kind of resonators here, here, sort of colors. And these resonators are there to shine microwave lights, uh, microwave microwaves onto the qubit, so to drive the qubits and control it to apply single qubit gates. And then you see you have also these kind of resonators linking various qubits, and these are there to apply two qubit gates. And you see it's kind of technological wise different to the ion traps we just saw, but you also have very different challenges because if you work with mi microwaves, you have to isolate your system from the environment, you work with the superconductivity, so you have to put everything <coughs> into very cold temperatures, and so on. Um, that's an example. We saw this like preview, a structure that um, IBM has currently, was 20 qubits, 
and then we have knots over the 50 cubits. And what you can see here is that you don't have every qubit connected to every qubit, but because you have some kind of physical limitations on what you can put on the chip, you have some kind of connectivity here. And also Google has... Are these really physical problems or technical problems? Is this crystal? I would say both. Um, so it's a, a technical problem because you need to... You need to connect everything to everything, but at the point where you need to cool down this to kind of very cold temperatures, meaning you need to put all the wires into your fridge, and um, then it becomes also a physical problem at some point because everything decoheres and so on. Um, Google has announced like 72 qubits. So this is how these superconducting qubit chips look like. Um, what you see basically here, this is a system that's a bit bigger than actually shown in a picture, which is just there to cool the chip to very cold temperatures. And all this environment you see here is to prepare all the microwaves and all the, the driving pulses to your qubit. And then you have your chip sitting somewhere in there. And you need to put for every qubit, you need to put wires in there. And um, that's why it's challenging and it's kind of picture by um, IBM. So, one more system, and it's a system we are working with. And this is single photons. So we take single particles of light, and you say, okay, if the photon is in horizontal polarization, then say it's in the zero state. If the photon is in vertical polarization, it's in one state. So you can just imagine it having two polarizations. And then the easy thing about these photonic systems is single qubit gates are pretty easy. So we put these kind of wave gates in here buy off the shelf and you just rotate the polarization. What is challenging with photons is two qubit gates because if you do take two light beams and shine them onto each other, basically nothing will happen so light doesn't interact. And in order to kind of circumvent this um, restriction, we have to do some tricks. And some of the tricks are kind of shown here. So we have an optical quantum circuit which has a control qubit and the target qubit as an input. We have some additional photons. We have some optical elements, some beam splitters here. <coughs> we perform some measurement here. And then this thing works in the way that if we have a certain event here, and if we measure a certain event here, then the two remaining photons here are in an entangled state. So this means that we can do this kind of two qubit gates, but we need some ancillary photons and some measurements. And this means we need some kind of additional resources. And I brought you a kind of picture for can we go back to the can we go back to the previous one before yes. I could? So what does it mean now to be in an arbitrary state that the x and y axis of this will can tilt? Yes. Okay, okay. Then I understand it correctly. Exactly. You tilt. And this is an animation from such C not gate and followed by C phase gate um, in our laboratory. And what you see is kind of an artist's impression, so it's not entirely correct in physics, but it gives kind of an idea of what we do. We have some kind of laser piles that we shoot into some crystal, and then we have kind of single photons emerging. And then we create some more photons as ancilla photons. And we do this kind of very quickly, like many times um, per second. So we have our stream of photons flying around in the lab. And then we have these kind of optical elements which rotate the polarization, and the photons interfere with beam splitters. We have these kind of mirrors guiding the photons. Um, yeah, so this can imagine can have a quantum state element rotate your quantum states and then you have more optical elements for your kind of set gate. So you basically build your quantum circuit out of optics. It's a little bit like Lego um, for adults. But this is only animation or is it? This is an animation but this is an actual photo. Um, looks a bit like the iron trap set up in the beginning. 
So what we have is we have a lot of kind of optics and a job of a kind of PhD student is to very precisely align all the optics and to deal with lasers. And then in the end we can do some quantum computation. And we do some other stuff which I talk about later. So this is um, what we deal with on a kind of daily basis. Um, yeah, one more thing. So as you can see that these optical tables are pretty bulky, they're kind of huge, every kind of optical element is kind of huge. So what people, including us, are working on is integration. So integrating all of these optical components onto some kind of chip. And here are some examples from Bristol and MIT. So instead of having such a huge beam splitter, you have just kind of kind of a cross crossing here. So this is kind of many beam splitters on a chip. And this is things we have in our lab. So this is for example a C phase gate, a tending gate on a chip. What is the size? So this is um, maybe seven, eight centimeters. It's relatively big in silica. Um, silicon chips of course much 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 more smaller. But but the principle stays the same. Principle stays, stays the same. on light, period. Yes. This is just light. Good. And I will come back to why it's good to use light at uh, the second part. And there do not exist any products on based on this third approach. This year? Yeah, uh, on, on the light approach. Are there products already? Um, there is a company, mm -hmm. but they don't have a product yet. Okay. Um, so there is a company in the States. You try to beat them. Well, we do something different. But better, yeah. <laughs> so, so what you see basically from the three examples I've shown you is that yes, there are amazing quantum systems and we can do many things already, but each system has kind of its own challenges. So some systems are easier control to control, some systems are more difficult to control, it. and um, it's um, I guess an exciting time to see how this all develops. Another question, yes, this company D-Wave, I think it's called. Yes. Yeah. So D-Wave is kind of a bit of a special case. It, it falls under the category of superconducting qubits, but they don't work on building a universal quantum computer, but they have something called a quantum annealer, which <coughs> is basically suitable to solve certain problems. So it's a kind of bit of a special purpose machine. So it's good for one task, but they can do so universal. Thing. Okay. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly here, D-Wave. So, um, <coughs> as you already heard, like, companies have started to invest in quantum computing and have their own quantum computing labs. You heard about IBM. There's D-Wave with this kind of special approach, or there's Google and Intel and so on. So, this was all about quantum computing. I want to tell you now I'd like to switch to quantum key distribution. Uh, Frank Lipkin mentioned a little bit about this. Basically, quantum key distribution is about exchanging secure keys or keys secured by quantum physics. So imagine you're James Bond and you have kind of Bond girl number one you want to talk to, um, but you don't want to Bond girl number two to listen to you or so. So what you need is a secure communication channel, and in order to do this, you need some of secure key and you very find you can use a one-time pad for this. And this is what quantum key distribution does. When you read about quantum key distribution, there are kind of different schemes um, and variation of these different schemes. I'm going to introduce kind of two of them briefly that you just get a flavor of how these things work. So the first scheme it's called prepared measure QKD, or very often just called BB84. This was kind of the first protocol. And this relies on Alice, prepares this quantum state, sends it to Bob, and Bob measures that state. The second approach is called um, E92, and it's based on entanglement. So this key uses entanglement to prepare this, or to share this key between Alice and Bob. Let's look at the first scheme first. So the first scheme we already heard works in the following way. So Alice has a machine which generates signal qubits. 
And Alice can decide to have a qubit prepared in a set eigenstate, so pointing up or down on the sphere, or Alice can choose to prepare it in an x eigenstate, so the qubit points left or right. So Alice does this randomly and sends these qubits to Bob. And Bob now performs a measurement. And Bob chooses either between the set measurement and an x measurement. And this means that if Alice has prepared qubit in the set basis here, so prepared a qubit in state one, and Bob measures in the basis set, then Bob will get the state one. If Alice has prepared the state zero, and Bob measures in the basis set, Bob will get the state zero. If Alice prepares the state one here in this basis, and Bob measures in a different basis, then Bob will get either plus or minus randomly. So if Bob measures in the same direction, Bob will always get the prepared bit. If Bob measures in a different direction, Bob will get a random bit. And the same here. So if Alice sends something in this basis and Bob measures in this basis, Bob will always get the same state out. If Bob decides to measure in a different basis, Bob will get a random state out. So if Alice prepares a basis, and Bob measures in the same basis, they have the same bit. And this is what they use for their key. Because if L sends a zero, Bob will get a zero. If they measure in a different basis, they get random results, and they just throw the results away. So how can we, why is this quantum secure now? So how can we detect the weak structure? So what happens if someone intercepts you, takes a photon out, or takes a qubit out and looks at the qubit? So we have already heard that a quantum bit cannot be cloned. So we cannot kind of sneak in, copy the quantum bit, and then measure our copy. So we have to do with the quantum, work with the quantum bit at the end. But if we measure this quantum bit on the way, we will change the state of the qubit. So we change the system. And now if Alice, uh, if Eve interferes you, she will change the state of the qubit, and Bob will get a random result. And what Alice and Bob do now is they prepare their key, they take part of their key and just call it, uh, each other up and ask on the phone, what did you get? And then they compare whether part of the key is correct. And if this key is correct and they don't spot an error, they will be happy and um, be sure that this transmission has happened securely. Good. So that's kind of... Um, the, the, the famous BB84 protocol. I'd like to briefly introduce a second concept of uh, quantum key distribution using entangled states. And this works in a kind of slightly different way. And we start by Alice and Bob, they share <coughs> some entangled state. So we have some entanglement servers sending one photon to Bob, one photon to Alice, and they're in this kind of bad state that we heard about earlier. So what, they, what you see now here from the state is, if Alice measures in um, a zero state, then Bob will also have a zero state, and if Alice measures one, then Bob will also have a one. And what is amazing about this quantum state now is that you can rewrite the state in this basis, and this means that if Alice measures in a diagonal basis, then Bob's qubit will also be prepared in a diagonal basis. And if Alice gets kind of the anti-diagonal basis, then Bob is also in the anti-diagonal basis. So the state is even much more powerful in the sense that if we measure in a different basis, Bob will always get kind of the same result. So the protocol now works in a way that um, Alice and Bob choose some measurement instructions. Again, they measure along X and Z and some intermediate thing. And they do all the same. So they take their qubits, they perform their measurements, and afterwards they talk to each other on the phone and ask, okay, which basis did you choose? And if they chose the same basis, they keep these bits for the key. If they chose a different basis, they keep these bits also because if Eve intercepts, she will destroy the entanglement. And this can be detected by a 
special test called a Bell test. And this Bell test basically computes, consists of a number of measurements, and from these number of measurements, we compute a number. And if this number is larger than two, we have entanglement. If this number is smaller than two, we don't have entanglement. So what Alice and Bob do is they choose the bases, <coughs> they choose the cases where they have different bases, and they calculate this number and use it to detect a key stroke. And this is how entanglement based quantum key distribution works. You might ask yourself, okay, how does this look in real life on experiment? Um, about 12 years ago, there was a nice experiment on the Canary Islands where they demonstrated this principle um, across a distance of 144 kilometers. So here on the panel, there was this kind of entangled photon source, this kind of green box here. And one photon was brought to Alice, who performed a quantum measurement here, shown in this box. And the other photon was here sent over its long distance to Bob. And then Bob, on his side, performed this kind of measurement. And that's how they kind of could demonstrate quantum key distribution over a long distance. What, 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 what was time important? Um, because you sent kind of many, many photons, and you want to make that um, you get the kind of photons corresponding to each other. So this is recent from last year, where people in China and Austria demonstrated a quantum secure telephone call. So they used this quantum satellite I showed earlier, and they um, exchanged a key such that they could afterwards do a kind of quantum secure telephone call between China, it's kind of hard to see here, and people in Austria here. And when you think what is implementations, so or ask yourself why do we don't we have kind of quantum security everywhere? Of course, it's very challenging. So if you send light over kind of long distances, you just want to detect your photons that you prepared and not all the other light around you. So you have photons everywhere and you need a very special detectors to just make sure you get this photon. And of course, if you want to go to space, you've seen these optical tables I showed you earlier. Imagine putting those onto a satellite Pretty challenging. And this is based on the data? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned briefly so, 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 so the future infrastructure will be full of lasers. We substitute all of our VLAN routers by lasers, isn't it? Maybe. No, no, Could okay. be. Isn't this then disturbing? So this is single photons. I mean, this, yeah, is, just, this is, you don't see it. It's okay, single. The photons. So in our lab, we work in the dark and try to make sure we don't have any photons in our detectors we don't want to see. So this is kind of one approach, going to space and going to satellites, yes. Uh, in order to, for this to work, you need the same basis for an innocent ball, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how do you exchange the basis in the first place? You classically. classically. So, so you just do all your basis settings. And afterwards, when you're done, you talk on the phone and compare where you are at the same basis. And how secure is this classic exchange? It doesn't matter anymore because your measurement is random. So if, if someone learns your basis afterwards, you have exchanged your key already. Okay. Um, so they can't intercept your the only danger is if someone learns your basis before you send your photon over, because they can measure that in the right basis and send the right photon. But if you have sent your quantum information already, then um, you just... Then there's no more chance to... Yeah. How big is the chance that you have the same basis? Well, yeah, it depends on the protocols. So there are many variations of this. In the simplest version, so Alice has kind of two Bases, the X and the Z bases, yeah. so this one or this one. Yeah. And Bob has two bases. Yeah. And um, so it's one half. It's one half that you have the same bases. And if someone intercepts, of course, they have one half of also having the same bases. But they can check. Times one half. And if you do this many times, okay. you can get it to very low numbers. Okay. 
So one quick word about fibers, um, because Frank mentioned this earlier on its own. There are um, many examples of fiber QPD networks. This is with in Tokyo 2010, there was European ones also. The reason for that is in China why they have kind of large scale QKD networks. But the question is why don't we have long distance QKD yet? So why don't we have a channel from Stuttgart to Berlin or wherever? And this is where quantum physics sneaks in again. So if we send light over fiber, we have huge losses. So if you take a photon and send it over 100 kilometers, um, only 1% of the photons will arrive. And in classical communication, it doesn't matter because you put in a quantum repeater or you enhance your signal. Now, you have a quantum state here. You can't just measure it and send it again. And this is why we need a quantum repeater. And building a quantum repeater is kind of a challenge on its own because it means you have to build some kind of quantum memory, so some device which stores your quantum state and so on. And there's currently an effort in Germany going on, on um, called Cumulink X, which kind of focuses on building these quantum repeaters. Good, so for the last minutes, I'd like to merge now the two topics. Um, yes, and talk about quantum networks. And why is quantum networks interesting? It's basically concerned with the question of how to make globalized computing safe. So in classical computing, we have cloud computing. And now quantum computing, we have a few quantum computing centers around the world. And what if you want to use the quantum computer, but don't want your, them to know your data or your computation? And this is what kind of quantum networks deal with. So we combine the advantages of quantum computing and quantum cryptography. So when I say quantum network, it's a bit challenging because people use this term in all kinds of settings. Um, here, what I mean by quantum <coughs> network is we have some kind of quantum computer nodes, it's kind of fancy squares here. Then we have some channels. They can be quantum channels or classical channels. Quantum channels mean we send photons or we send qubits or we send entangled state. Classical channels means we send classical bits, and we have some clients like you and me, which um, can have a little bit of quantum power, but much less than those quantum computers. And this is what I mean by quantum network. Um, quantum networks are quite um, popular right now, so this is the paper still what, heard. What yeah. is the focus of quantum network? I will get to this. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so, this is kind of a paper sort of curve of a tight of quantum networks to 2017. You see kind of um, this increase in popularity also when you look into citations of this kind of term quantum network. So what can we use quantum networks for? We want to use them for secure quantum computing. And in my group, what we are investigating is also some intermediate thing between quantum and classical computing. And this is kind of briefly what I'm going to introduce now. So the, the prime application for a quantum network is something called secure dedicated quantum computing or called quantum cloud computing or client quantum computing. And this is um, a way such that a client can send a quantum computation to a server and use all the full power of this quantum computer but the data and the computation remain perfectly private. So this means that the input data remains private, the output data, and also the algorithm itself. So this quantum computer is performing a quantum computation, but actually does not know whether it's performing Deutsch's algorithm or Grover's algorithm, or some factoring, or some other task. Are you saying that the algorithm itself is also sent to the quantum computer? Mm -hmm. In a kind of way. And um, I think I'm going to skip this. Um, I just go to briefly introducing how this works. And the way this works uses um, a slightly different model of quantum computing called one-way quantum computing. The only thing you need to know about one-way quantum computing is you kind of have a model where you apply all the entangling gates first, 
and you do all the single qubit gates in the end, and instead of doing the single qubit gates, you do some kind of special measurements such that you can um, run your algorithm in the end by just applying two qubit gates and some special measurements. Um, but it's everything you need to know. So the way this works is the client prepares some qubits in some random states like in the quantum key distribution, and these qubits are sent to the server. The server now entangles the qubits, applies all the entangling gates, and this is in a very general way, the kind of most general way possible. And the server has now this powerful quantum resource, um, but actually since we have quantum states, it's not know what the state of this qubit is. So it's like in QKD, if I send you a qubit, you can't copy it, you can't read it out, um, but you can entangle it. And this is what the server does here. Then the client um, computes the program, and this program depends on these kind of states of these qubits, and there are some random bit flip outs on top, so it's some kind of encoded program. And this encoded program is now sent to this quantum server, <coughs> And the quantum server has now this powerful entangled quantum gates containing all the C not gates, C phase gate, all the entangling gates, and now has these measurement instructions here. And now the computation works by performing measurements, encoded measurements on these encoded qubits. And you can show that, um, of course, you can do quantum computing like this. And you will get some results, but since these qubits are encoded and these measurement instructions here are encoded, your output of your computation will be encoded, and then these results are sent back to the client who can decode the results um, because, of course, the client has all the information about the encoding. And this is how client quantum computing or secure delegate computing work. You encode your qubits, you encode your program, and you run your encoded program on your encoded qubits. And because you have qubits, you cannot just read out your, your quantum state and say it's secure. So we have implemented this experimentally. And this is just for you to see how something like this looks like. That's a four qubit applied quantum computing, again, with lots of optical elements here. And what we could also show is that using this kind of four qubit system, we could do some single qubit gates, some plan two qubit gates, and some crowbars and some Schwarz algorithm. And we could show <coughs> that those um, remain hidden from the server. I guess I'm going to skip these details. So what we could show basically is that the server couldn't distinguish between running something like this, running a quantum algorithm, or running a two qubit gate. So this was published in 2012. If you have any questions about this, I'm happy to talk to you later. This also caused some kind of media attention back then because um, it's a way to kind of perform quantum secure cloud computing. No German newspaper. In Spanish, Russian. I don't know. This is Austrian. German. <laughs> <laughs> um, good, and then we dive like further into these quantum networks and we ask ourselves, okay, if you have now a powerful quantum computer and you get back a result, how do you actually know whether a result is correct if you're not able to compute it? And this is what we ask ourselves then. We came up with some method. Basically, it's instead of running computations, you sneak in from time to time some verification procedures, which are very simple computations. And if your server cannot see whether you're running a computation or verification, then you can um, make sure that your computation is correct. And so um, it is not real testing. Test cases are kind of No, this is just so testing. What you can also test so is whether a quantum computer is quantum yeah. so. and whether it operates you, your result is correct, basically. And what we then ask ourselves is a kind of more fundamental question. 
and this is, can be used in quantum networks or for classical computing. And when I say classical computing, I mean kind of very classical computing primitives like CNOT, uh, XOR gates or something like that. And it's not a very, it's, it's not a um, approach that you can use in like huge cloud networks now, and you can use to do um, large scale computation. The idea behind this was more can we kind of combine quantum and classical resources in a way such that we can use quantum networks for classical computing. And what we did is we just came up with a scheme that I showed here. We had some client, and this client had access to single qubits, and we had qubits from a server to a client. This client performed kind of single qubit gates. Um, and we could show that this resulted in a kind of encrypted NAND gate in the end. So this is kind of a very expensive NAND gate by using quantum bits and single qubit gates, but we could show that how we can combine different types of resources. And this is how such an implementation would look like. It's rather simple because we just have a photon source, single photons, we have some quantum gates and some measurement here. And this is how something like a photon source then looks in the laboratory. And of course, we could show that we get a NAND gate out. <coughs> and then to, close, to finish this, so the next thing we ask ourselves is, OK, can we do multi-party computing in this kind of setting? So we have some kind of quantum network. We have qubits. We have some quantum gates. We have some clients with inputs. We have some outputs. And we came up with a kind of protocol. I won't go into detail here. It's just um, basically to show that we start with a server with keywords, we have some clients, and these clients apply some operations, and then we get back the result, and what we manage to do is to compute this kind of function here. And this is all kind of classical computing in a quantum network and looking at combinations of different resources. And what you could show is so that this is how the experiment looked like could show that this worked. So basically, I've shown you um, the merge of quantum computing with quantum cryptography. I've shown you kind of four applications of quantum networks. And what my group, what we're doing at the moment is we have a huge kind of five-year project to work on exactly these questions, to work on building photonic quantum hardware, so to replace these kind of nodes with tiny silicon photonic chips and then to work on protocols for things we can do in these quantum networks. So to sum up my talk, I've started with quantum computing from a physics perspective and then looked into quantum hardware. I hope I gave you some impression on why it is difficult to build a quantum computer and why we cannot just have 2,000 qubits. I've shown you what physical principles lie behind quantum key distribution. I've shown you how we can merge quantum computing and quantum key distribution to perform some secure quantum computation in networks and on some quantum clouds. So with that, I'd like to finish here. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or I'm around um, for a few days. Also, I'm happy to discuss. Thank you.
talk to each other and agree on what kind of measurement we did on the quantum state. So yes, entanglement means that I perform a measurement here and change the quantum state elsewhere, but I don't transfer information there. In order to transfer information, I always need a kind of classical link, and this is why we're still at kind of the speed of light. Any more questions? If not, thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you. So we continue at 3 p.m. Right? 3 p.m. So enough time to chat. Do we have lunch here? We go to the library, to the main. The conference is that it's a half walk. Ah, okay. Lunch, you know, lunch or dinner.